Good evening, everyone. Um, it's Wednesday night. We are gathering this evening for our Bible study. So what we've got going this evening is this going out live on our Facebook page. And at the same time, we have um, our, our Zoom up and running as well. So if you see me, my head turning backwards and forwards is only because I'm looking at the different screens in case that anybody else comes into the Zoom. Uh, what we're going to do is have our Bible study on both the platforms here, but then um, once we finish the Bible study about eight o'clock, then we shut down Facebook and we have our prayer time on Zoom. Um, so if anyone wants to join us, you're very welcome to on Zoom. If you don't have those details, you could send me a text message. You could send them on to you. Um, uh, just bear with me then if we're doing that. Um, but we'll get started this evening anyway. So as we come together in the madness as I look between three screens here, because I've got my Bible on one screen and the Facebook and Zoom, let's pause Let's draw breath and let's pray to God. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Lord, you have been with us all of the day. Your blessing has been upon us. Your presence has been with us. And Lord, we have really felt that and we thank you for that. Lord, we just pray now that at the end of a busy day, that as we come to look at your word, that you would just still and quieten our hearts that we would just have that sense of your calming hand on us. And that as we come to your word, that you would give us ears to see, a heart that is open, a mind that is receiving towards you, that we would hear you speak and hear your spirit speak to us through your word. So Father, we thank you now and come to you as we now study. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, folks. I know last week we touched a little bit on the start of Hebrews chapter 12, but I really want to get into the start of it in a bit more detail this evening. So I'm going to read for you, first of all, Hebrews 12 verses 1 to 11. Um, I'm reading it from the New Living Translation, just so that you know. So let me read these verses to you. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off everything that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiate, initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honour beside God's throne. Thinking of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in the struggle against sin. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means you are illegitimate and not really his children at all. Since we respect our earthly fathers who discipline us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father uh, of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us, so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Amen. Let's pause it there at a minute. Hebrews 12 really gets back to the crux of everything that's going on, um, everything that's leading up to this. So we've had lots of talk about Jewish customs, um, lots of things about what, what people do and don't do. And so the writer gets down to some of the, the nuts and bolts and the nitty gritty um, or what really means to us. And he makes it very clear right in the very start of this um, chapter. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, do you like people watching? Do you, do you like or do you miss being able to sit at, at a cafe and getting a cup of tea or coffee 
and sitting down and watching the world go by. I think we're all a wee bit nosy that way, aren't we? We all enjoy doing things like that. It's interesting as people go by trying to guess their story, isn't it? You know, we if you get a conversation with a friend who's there, wonder what their story is, and you know, we're like that. We're nosy, but we've got to watch out for that as well because it means that people are watching us. We're not just watching them, but they are watching us, and that's what the author says here. You know, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. If we're open about our faith, which we should be, if we wear our faith uh, on our sleeve, the way people talk about wearing their heart on their sleeve, we let everyone know that we are Christians, then people will watch us and they'll judge us and they'll point fingers at us. You know, so we do have witnesses around us. In one way, that's scary. But in another way, it's a sobering thought or it's a thought that keeps us always thinking about what we're doing so that we are living the life that God wants us to. So as he says that, the author uses um, this phrase, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. He talks about things that slow us before he talks about sin. So he's actually telling us, you know, there are things that you can do which are not sinful. Um, but maybe are not the best things to do because they slow us down or they hinder us or we have the possibility of tripping up. Uh, and in, and after that, then, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. As I was reading that, it reminded me of um, what Paul was writing back in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 23 and 24 says, You say, I am allowed to do anything. But not everything is good for you. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own goods, but for the good of others. You know, even Paul was saying back there that there are lots of things that you, you might do, you, you could do, but what's the benefit? Not just to you, but more importantly, what's the benefit to others? Because if we are surrounded by witnesses as they watch what we do they copy what we do um it's a bit like children if you watch if you watch a child a child will copy what a father will do you know what what parents will do what a father and mother will do um if you watch a, a, a special little girl with a doll holding it if there's a baby in the house she'll hold the doll the same way as a mum will hold the baby um I, i've watched a, a father walking along with his hands behind his back and you see the, the child, the son coming along behind with the same walk and the same meaner. You know, it, it, it's we copy one another. And that's the, the warning here. You know, if we are surrounded by such a crowd of witnesses, then there's an onus upon us about how we live and how we walk. And that's why he says, strip off every weight that slows us down, but especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let's run with endurance the race that God has set before us. You know, we need to keep going every single day. And it's hard and it's difficult. And I know it is. But it's about making our lives uncluttered. Removing obstacles uh, and living that life that God wants us to. That's something we'll actually look at on Sunday as we start a new series uh, called Worship in the Wilderness. Uh, so setting aside the, the Sermon on the Mount for um, these weeks leading up to Lent uh, and looking at a series um, called Worship in the Wilderness and it's about setting things aside. It's about how we worship in that um, and, and that's really what the author said here to get rid of all those things that are slowing you down. Get rid of the sin and, and just focus upon God so that you can run that race. You know running was, was their thing in that day. It was the thing that, that you know that they really did and so those words, to run um, with endurance, the race that God has set before us, they understood that by keeping going to the end. And that's what we really need to do. As you get into verse 2 then, um, it says, We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith, or the one who starts and keeps our faith going, is another way of translating it. Um, 
or there's another way, yeah, the originator and the perfecter of our faith. There's slightly different ways that Greek can be translated. But it, it, again, it's saying to us that it's Jesus. It's because of what Jesus has done that we have this faith. It's not because of us, because we can't do it. It's all because of Jesus, which is actually really good because it means then we can't mess it up because it's not what we would do quite a lot of the time. We would mess it up. Whereas because it's Jesus that does it, he doesn't mess up. And because our perfection is based upon him, it doesn't get messed up either because it's all about Christ and what he has done for us. So we need to, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and to rely upon him. You know, it talks a lot here about Jesus in this verse. It goes on to say that because of the joy awaiting him, sometimes it's translated instead of the joy awaiting him, it says he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now, again, maybe that sounds familiar to you, and it should do if you've read parts of the Old Testament. Um, one part where it's quoted, a, well, one part where it's mentioned is in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23 which says anyone who is hung on a tree, and that can also be um, translated as impaled on a pole, is cursed in the sight of God. Now that's quoted in Galatians 3.13. Um, and again, talking about the crosses in Isaiah 53. So being hung on a cross, being hung on something cut from a tree, um, was being cursed in the sight of God. And the rest of this verse is talking about, even though Jesus knew what was waiting him in heaven, he, he, he could have bypassed the cross and gone straight to heaven and nobody could have faulted him for doing that. But he didn't. He was prepared to be cursed by God so that we could have our sins forgiven. You know, and you think about whenever Jesus says on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, and, and Jesus knows at that stage is cursed by his father and his father turn, has to turn his back on him because as he hangs in that tree taking our sins, God can't look on him because he, he is he covered, he's full of our sin and he pays the price for it so that we can have our faith started and perfected. That's amazing when you think about that, what he did for us. He suffered so much for us just so that we could be forgiven. And it says, now he is seated in the place of honour beside God's throne. And that's again to remind us that Jesus is no longer on the earth. He's no longer on the cross. He's no longer in the grave. But he rose again. He ascended into heaven. The first to be reborn with that new body. And now he sits at God's right hand. And again, elsewhere in the Bible talks about how he intercedes for us. That means as, as Satan tries to accuse us, so we do something wrong. Satan's very quick in the presence of God to go, oh, look at what they've done. Look, look, they call themselves a Christian, one of your children, and look what they've done. And Jesus just says, no, they're covered by my blood. They've got my grace. So it doesn't, you can't point a finger at them. They are forgiven because of what I have done for them. And again, that should spur us on and should lift our hearts to think that we are right in the presence of God. Verse 3 talks about more that Jesus suffered. It says, think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. You know, when you reflect upon the Gospels and about Jesus' journey, how he, he as he travelled around, he didn't have anywhere to live himself. He was ridiculed at times by the people. They plotted to stone him to try and kill him. Um, they then had him arrested, they had him beaten and tortured, they had him flogged, and I don't think we can really appreciate that. I mean, I think if you if you watch the movie The Passion that Mel Gibson did, I mean, I know he's not, Mel Gibson doesn't do a lot of things which are good, but when you start to realise and you start to see some of the images and that, you realise, you start to realise what Jesus suffered at the hands of people, um, the hostility that he endured. Uh, and it says, if you, if you can think of that, he says, then you won't become weary and give up. In other words, you haven't, you know, if you look at what Jesus has done for you, then you keep on going. 
And he's very pointed about it. He says, after all, you have not yet given up your lives in your struggle against sin. So these people might be facing some opposition in Hebrews, um, but they're not facing a critical opposition. They're not facing an opposition where um, any of them have died. Um, they haven't faced that sort of persecution. So maybe the author's scolding them a wee bit, saying, Look, what are you complaining about? Why are you giving off? You mean, get a grip of yourselves. Look at what Jesus did for you and, and you're complaining. That should have the opposite effect. It should spur you on. And then he gets into um, maybe again something just to bring them down to earth as he talks about discipline. Uh, and verse five, it says, um, have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? Um, that word children sometimes translated as sons as well. Um, my child and my son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't give up when he corrects you for the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. You know, parents can understand that you discipline your children because you want them to learn. Um, I think what we have to say right from the very outset from that is getting the right meaning of that word discipline. Um, that word discipline over the years has meant terrible things for some people. It has meant beatings. It's meant, you know, food being taken off people. It's meant people being locked away. That's not discipline. Um, Discipline is whenever you are correcting somebody for, for what they've done wrong. You're trying to teach them how to do what is right. And God does that with us. He disciplines us. He, he corrects us. Whenever we think of it as, as walking on a path and as we try to walk along that path, as we stray off that path, discipline is God pulling us back onto that path again. It's a bit like if you've, if you've got a dog on a big long lead. Uh, and the dog, you, and you let go of the button and you let the dog run around. And you're, you're wanting to see if the dog will follow you at your side. And after a while, if it doesn't, you, you slowly then bring the lead back in again. And you rein the dog back in so it's walking beside you. Um, you're training the dog. Maybe not a good analogy, or maybe we don't like to think of ourselves that way. But it is that sort of sense where God wants us to walk in tune with him. He wants us to have the same heart as him, the same desires as him. To see people know him, to see people have that relationship with him, to see people enriched by that relationship. Uh, and, and for us to be enriched, then at times it means we do need to be disciplined. And that means God telling us, no, you're wrong. You're going off in the wrong track. I'm not going to stop you where you are. And maybe in earthly terms, it means that he takes things away from us. Um, and, you know, he, he, he removes some of those things that we've had in the past before. So that we can actually focus again upon him. And again, that reflects back to what I said at the start about the author said about stripping away the things that aren't helpful, especially the sin. You know, and it, and it is keeping that focus upon God and keeping our focus upon where we should be and what we should be doing. I mean, the author he even quotes um, Proverbs. So um, the tail end of verse five and verse six is a quote from Proverbs 3, 11 to 12. Now, this is one of the funny things about um, the Bible at times. So if you were to take your Bible right now and if you were to turn to Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 and you were to compare them to what's in here, you would see that there are slight differences because this quotation is taken directly from the Greek version and not from the Hebrew version, whereas our Bibles are translated the Old Testament from the Hebrew version. Whereas quite a lot of times whenever you see quotes in the New Testament, the authors are quoting the Greek version because that's what they knew, that's what they'd grown up with. It had been translated from Hebrew into Greek, whereas we've gone Hebrew into English. So you get slight differences in the language at times, slight nuances, but it doesn't change the meaning. It doesn't change what it's about. Um, so it says there, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. He punishes each one he accepts as his child. You know, we should be pleased that God wants to discipline us because it means that he's accepted us. It means that he loves us. Um, and unlike what it says, that you know, it doesn't mean that we are illegitimate the way it says in verse 8. You know, God doesn't discipline you. You're not his child. You know, if, if you're not following him, he doesn't care about you. Well, he does care about you, but he's not going to discipline you. 
There's no point God disciplining you until you come to faith. And it's whenever we come to faith and we start that relationship with him that he disciplines us. And that's what the author is saying here. Once we are his child, then we can expect that discipline. We can expect that correcting hand on our shoulder. We can expect that voice in our ear saying, no. Or if you think of it, as a child goes to do something and all you hear is the parent going, no. And you know that stern voice and the finger goes up. Uh, it's that sort of idea where God is disciplining us and saying, no, I don't want you to do that. And if you do that, you're going to end up hurting yourself. You're going to end up causing anguish to yourself. You're, you're getting further away from me and you're going to have to repent and come back again. You know, sometimes we go on ahead and do it, don't we? Sometimes we go off on our own track. But God doesn't let go of us because he loves us and cares for us. So he disciplines us. So with that in mind, then come to verses 12 and 13. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. So yeah, it looks like these people here in Hebrews are, are struggling a little bit. They're finding it difficult. They're struggling with their faith. They're maybe struggling with the temptations that are around them. Um, there's maybe different voices say, oh, you can do this, you can do that, it's fine, it's not wrong. You know, and there's all that struggle going on. And the author said, look, just focus your eyes on Christ. Focus on what he has done for you. Realise what it's all about. Share these other things. And yes, if things are going badly for you, then, you know, God's disciplining you. God, God's trying to get you back on track again. So take grip with your tired hands. Yes, I know it's hard, but keep going. Again, run with endurance. Strengthen your weak knees. You know, it, it is a hard slog. You will feel tired at times. The Christian life is not easy. We face lots of opposition, but we keep going. And mark out a straight path for your feet. So that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. There's a sense in that verse, there's very strong in that verse that we are not doing this on our own. But we are doing this as a group of believers. So not only is it your personal walk of faith, but it's how you walk together as a body of God's people. And how you help one another. Um, or how you disciple one another how you encourage one another and about how if we are striking the right path and if we walk that right path, then those who are watching us will be strengthened, will be encouraged, will, will be able to keep going with that. You know, and that is so important. You know, how often do we say about our children or have we said about other children, oh, look, look at them, they've got into bad company and they've led them astray. It's the same in Christian faith. You know, if we, if we let ourselves be aligned with people who um, are not really following God's path and who are doing their own thing, we'll get led astray, astray as well. But on the counter of that, if we do walk a strong path and if we do keep our feet firmly on the path that God has led out in front of us, then we can help others as we walk this walk together. We don't do it alone. We have to do it together. Uh, so much of the Bible is about being part of God's body and about how we are different parts working together. And that is so true. And again, these verses bear that out. We do this together. So with that, again, with that in mind, look at verse 14 and 15. Work at living in peace with one another and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other. So that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up um, to trouble you, corrupting many. Work at living in peace. So living in peace is not easy. Living in peace doesn't come naturally as such. We have to work at it. We have to put in the effort. Work at living a holy life. It's the same. Following the path that God has put in front of us is hard work. We have to work at it. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. It's basically, it's 
if we don't have faith, then we don't see the Lord. If we do have faith, then yes, it will be hard. It will be tough at times. But look what we've got waiting for us. Jesus is the author or the starter and the initiator and the perfecter of our faith. That's what's watching, waiting for us. So, so look out so that none of you will fall. We, we, there's a command to look out for one another. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. So be careful in our relationships with, with one another. Be careful that we have the right relationships because it's so easy for our relationships to get damaged and for that to damage other relationships. That's a challenge at times, isn't it? Living at peace, living without bitterness, living a holy life. It isn't easy. It is, it is hard. But that's what God calls us to do. So let's just pause and think about that for a moment. And then I'll lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Father, your word challenges us that we would live in harmony with one another, that we would live a holy life, that there wouldn't be bitterness. Father, right now we hand over to you those relationships that we have with other Christians which are difficult. We think about those with whom relationships are strained. We ask you to help us to live in peace, to live that holy life free of bitterness. Father, we know people are watching us, so help us to really let your light shine as we live our lives for you. Thank you, Father. We trust it all into your hands now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks, folks, for... Um Joining us on um, Facebook, we are going to switch down, switch off Facebook for now and transfer on to Zoom for our time of prayer. So thank you for joining with us. Take care. God bless. We're back again next Wednesday for the next part of our Bible study. Till then, see you later. Bye for now.